The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that buzz the next. Big jab there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, Down goes Duffy out cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock him, sock him, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bull artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. All right, great to be back in your lives. Just so fucking great to be in your lives. Thursday, February 16th, the year's 2023. Hope everybody had a nice Valentine's Day. We're going three wide today on the Anakin Florian Podcast. It's episode 389 of the program, coming up on our eight-year anniversary in April. One guy who hasn't been with us every step of the way, but we're certainly glad he's here now. See, I stopped myself from swearing there. I was going to (laughs) say, sure as F, glad he's here now. Big gun Brian Petrie. What's up, man? What's up? I have been here the whole time because I was a day one listener. So oh, it's pretty crazy. I'm yeah. on the fucking well, thank show. You. Uh, but everything's good, man. Last Saturday, UFC 2. Ooh, ooh, let's oh, talk about oh, it. Let's oh. talk about it. All right. <laughs> we have a lot to get into, and we appreciate your extended time today. Real quickly, last week on the show, mm-hmm. before I left for Perth, there were a lot of people in the comments that were banging on me for my foul mouth, you know, more so sure. than ever before. I don't know if it's the transition to the DraftKings YouTube channel, maybe different people right. ingesting the show. I do have a healthy respect for our younger audience. I can't tell you how many 8, 9, 10, 11 year old boys I've met in Australia that are diehard fans. But, right. um, you know, I cuss in front of my kids. I cuss in front of our listeners' kids. And uh, I don't know. People yeah. seem particularly upset. The MMA Takes podcast, um, yeah. you got a pretty foul mouth in your own right. Hundred percent. Like I, I've explained before, my mother's from Long Island, born and raised. She talks like Ray Longo. So I grew up in a household with very foul language, and it kind of spilled over to me. I have been trying to taper it off a little bit. My daughters yell at me every time I cuss. I usually do it in the car with some kind of road rage incident. But yeah, I see some of those comments. They're like, it's weird to me when John Anna cusses. I'm like, the guy's a fucking human. Oh, there I go. The guy's a human being. You know what I mean? Like, let him live his life. I, I've never found it offensive. Uh, but, you know, I know different fo- different strokes for different folks, I guess, you know. This was the first time I had ever really been forced to do a self-assessment about it. And even if my thesis statement is that I cuss too much, at this point, it's who I am. You know, 44-year-old sure. man from, from Massachusetts. Yeah. I mean, there's really You're not much in, we can do man. right now to uh, to change stripes, you know. Mm-hmm. Texted my daughter LFG the other day. She's 11. She's like, what is that? It's like, let's <laughs> fucking go, Riley. Let's fucking go. Whoa. All right. I want to get into a few things UFC 284 related and without shortchanging the rest of the fight cad, I want to know how you saw Islam Akashev versus mm-hmm. Alexander Volkanovsky and how you think they'll proceed based upon the competitive nature uh, of that epic encounter. So I, I feel so privileged to be an MMA fan. I want to say that first because to me, Saturday night, that was a special fight. I've been on this show for a little over or almost a year now, been an MMA fan since I was a little kid. I don't really take lightly. You've never heard me say, that's my favorite fight. Oh, that's not my favorite fight because a Regency bias. But that is quickly top five favorite fight of mine. The stakes, the crowd, the drama, the skill was unbelievable. With that being said, I did score it for Islam. I had 3-2 Islam. A buddy of mine who I took to Vegas with me was a very keen eye in MMA. He had it for Volkanovski. Um, I just thought, you know, obviously it, it, round one, we go Islam, you ended on the back on the cage round two, very close. I gave it to Islam round three. I thought was Volk round four, clear Islam. He had his back the whole time. And then round five, clear Volk. Um, unbelievable fight. Uh, I think they need to run it back. I feel bad for saying that because Benny Darius is coming out going, they're just waiting for me to retire before I get a title shot. And he's fighting Charles. And I think both those guys deserve it at 55. I think 45 can chill for a little bit. I think Yair can fight the winner, Max, Arnold Allen, when they fight. Um, but, I mean, how can you not run it back? I mean, it's it just so – it's too perfect, you yeah. know? So, it's amazing. Kenny, before it was amazing. we get into Brian Petrie's bankroll, I've oftentimes yeah. said you're betting the number and not the fighter. And before mm-hmm. I get into something gambling-related as far as my opinion going into that first fight, are you actively betting Ken Flo? Like, are you? did you bet this fight or no? You're not really, right? I did not, no. No, you got a couple kids, probably Bitcoin, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So, all right. So there was a plus 330 in some parts next to Alexander Volkanovsky's mm-hmm. name. Am I correct, Ryan Petrie, or is that a little yeah. bit inflated? I He opened at plus four, uh, 340, uh, okay. and I swooped that up, and then okay. I got him at plus 300 fight week. 
All right. So you're betting the number. You're not betting the fighter. Mm -hmm. Right. So obviously, if somebody says, you know, gun to a dog's head, who wins the fight? Then maybe you might take Islam Akasha, but you're going to bet on the number, which is plus 340. That was the craziest thing that I have seen in a long time. I understand the mystique with Islam Akashev. I still think mm-hmm. he's underappreciated as a fighter. But Ken Flo, like if I was removed from the space, I probably shouldn't even admit this, but you know what? I'm going to fucking do it. I'm going to put a fucking F word <laughs> in front of him. I'll fucking do it. That would have been one of the bigger bets I'd ever placed in my life, you know, right. on Alexander Volkanovsky at that number. Seeing a number mm-hmm. like plus 340 next to the name of the number one pound for pound fighter in the world is patently absurd. It's absurd. No question about it. It's why it's why I went that way. It's why Brian went mm-hmm. that way. And, you know, I think it was close enough to say, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we absolutely had a point. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. what do you think the price would be for the rematch? I don't think it's going to be the same uh, unless, you co- I don't know, Cody, maybe you're not referencing that. I think it's going to be much tighter. And I do believe that at any plus number, plus 190 or so, Brian, I feel like mm-hmm. people are going to bet Volkanovski based upon the competitiveness of the first fight. What do you think? Any, or I don't like necessarily putting you on the spot like it, but what do you think sure. might be the better yeah. line for the rematch? Yeah, I think it would open up with, with maybe Islam two to one. I, I think you're, you're in the right direction there. And I think it'll be, get bet down really quick. I think if you see a plus number in Volkanovski early like that, you jump on it. I know a lot of guys are, let me wait out the line type guys. Now you hammer that number when you see a plus number. Uh, you're never going to get a plus 340, plus 300 on Volkanovski again. He proved he's number one pound for pound, being a little undersized, right, and maintaining a guy like Islam, who I thought fought great, by the way. I I, I know this all talks about Volkanovski. He fought great. His distance, his left hand was on point all night. Obviously, the big question was, oh, can, can Islam, you know, stop, not stop? What would he do if he can't get him taken down? You know, he stood up with one of the best strikers in the yeah. division. Um, so if you get a plus number on Volkanovski, though, you hammer it for sure. Uh, yeah, I think two to one bet down. I think we're closing at maybe minus 150 plus 125 area is what I would get. Uh, anything over that or anything plus, I think you hammer. So uh, I like when you use that verb. So, so what So what? you were betting this live. You had a bet mm-hmm. on Alexander Volkanovski live, if I'm not mistaken, which was probably a pretty sage bet, even though it didn't cash. So uh, did he take yeah. a fucking bath on the Volk man or what? So I did. So I had I had two half unit bets early. I got the plus three forty, got the plus three hundred fight week. Midway through the third round, where I thought Volk was starting to kind of find it a little bit, you know, I had like a weird, like this weird feeling that he's going to turn around. It was plus two forty five, and I had I had just won a lot on Yair. So I go, we're we're we're, we're three potting this. We're putting another one on Volkanovski because I think this guy's doing it. So yeah, I took a little bit of a, a, a loss. And I hate to be one of those gamblers that go, I was on the right side, you know, because the right side is the winning side. But again, you said it perfectly. When you get Alexander Volkanovsky at plus 300, you hammer the shit out of it. It's crazy to me. Uh, Vegas missed that one for sure. Because I know you said there's a lot of mystique with Islam. Was Islam going to go in there and, and, and take him down and submit him like he's done everyone? You know, I don't even know if he had a submission attempt, really. I mean, he definitely didn't in the fourth round. So yeah, uh, interesting right. stuff there. Yeah. So what do you have for us on Yair Rodriguez? Like I'm running out of superlatives. I can't even articulate. I can't even articulate what I'm seeing. I just know that it's not like anything else. Yeah, I I just knew you know Kenny gave a really good breakdown I w- last week and I we I picked uh, Yair and I was trusting my own gut, but I just thought the distance and I think Emmett. I love Josh Emmett. He seems like a great guy, but I feel like he's kind of a one trick pony. Great boxing, but he doesn't maintain the distance well. And Yair's kicks are special. I mean, they're so fast, so powerful. And Yair got clipped a little bit in that first round. He kind of the top of his head wobbled a little bit, went to his back. And that's the one thing that really impressed me off his back, feet on the hips, open guard. And if he was a close guard, he's elbowing you in the fucking head. He was active, which was really nice to see because that was kind of a knock on him in his, in his earlier days, you know, the Frank Yeager fight uh, and so forth. But, uh, I, I'm just blown away by this guy. It makes me want to see Yair Volk that much more, but I think yeah. Volk has some unfinished business. You know what I mean? It's like you can't go wrong if, if you're Volkanovski. You have two fights that are money fights, in my opinion. Kenny, you sort of got fast tracked to the UFC, right? But for a lot of these guys, like for Josh Emmett, you know, maybe he won. I think he won a West Coast championship at some point in time. But for Yair Rodriguez, like Josh Emmett seemed to be more of a Justin Gaethje mindset about the UFC interim 
featherweight championship that that wouldn't really mean as much to him. And obviously for Yaya Rodriguez, he still feels like there's unfinished business, right? But he's a world champion, right? That he's all over Mexico with that belt already been memorialized. You know what I mean? Or or immortalized with artwork and everything else. Like, I don't know about defending interim championships per se, right? If this were to be an extended stay, right? But where do you fall in terms of the extent to which Jair Rodriguez should embrace this UFC interim featherweight championship? Because I think obviously he should be all in. Yeah, listen, I, I think it is, it's clear that it is a massive achievement, right? And, and you get a belt in yeah. the UFC, interim or otherwise, this is huge. The problem, though, is you have, you know, the greatest pound for pound fighter in the UFC right now in your division. So I think that's, you know, Emmett's way, for example, of him saying, you know, we got to give respect to Volk. He's, he's still the dude. I can't call myself the dude until I beat the dude. However, a belt is a belt in the UFC. That is that is a massive, massive accomplishment. And doing it in the way that he did uh, that night uh, in Australia against Emmett um, is, is certainly worthy of praise. And these guys like Mike Valley and Izzy Martinez that have put in 10 years with this guy, just knowing how special he was, if you can just keep him tracked, right, and Mm -hmm. just have so much respect to him. And he's just totally come into his own as an athlete, you know? And uh, I don't know. I think it stands to reason that the best is ahead for Yair Rodriguez. I do think that if if he does fight Volkanovski, I ain't waiting until September. Volkanovski sounds like a guy that wants to fight four times in 2023. So uh, mm-hmm. he's making money. He's in his prime. You know, he wants to yeah, fight. Yeah. And uh, obviously he didn't absorb what amounted to appreciable damage. Kenfo, real quickly, wanted to get your thoughts on Jimmy Crute and Alonzo Menafield. Um, no fight of the night bonus, I guess, unfortunately, for these guys. Upstaged by Islam Akashev and Alexander Volkanovsky. But great back and forth affair. You had a round one in which Jimmy Crute, I think, secured four takedowns and still lost the round. You had Mark Goddard taking a point away. And in my mind, rightfully so. Great step in the right direction when it comes to fence grabs. Majority draw for Crute and Alonzo Menafield. And uh, McMaynard, I did speak with him at an airport lounge. He's going to run it right back. But your thoughts on the light heavyweights Crute and uh, and Alonzo Menafield? Yeah, you know, I thought it was the right call, you know, uh, with the draw there. Bo- both guys um, had their moments. I thought it was going to be a close fight. That was a tough one for me to pick. Uh, but I, I also think you, you got to mention it. And, and exciting as hell, tough individuals, uh, chin, determination, comebacks back and forth. That that absolutely should be highlighted. But also, I think there was a lot of poor decision making. I mean, I, <laughs> Brian, if you gambled that fight, I, I would I would have had a heart attack seeing it back and forth. Yeah. Like, what are these guys doing? The decision. Huh that they were making while they were fighting him. Like, what in the hell is going on? Um, yeah. If I'm a coach, I would be pissed off. It, it, both sides, whoever you're coaching, because some of the decisions they were making, I, I think, was extremely risky or, or poor. But, um, yeah, uh, there's so much potential in both of those guys, and, and they have enough experience now where I, I think they should be a little bit um, better with their decisions that they make in there. So, I don't know. I, I think they've reached their potential. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see anything better out of those guys in the future on, on a technical level, on a tactical level. Uh, but both guys are, are so damn tough. It was a great fight, action packed. And for that, they should be applauded. No question about it. I don't know if the Bendigo bomber, Jimmy Crute, listens to the show. He's a good friend of mine. I think he would agree with most of what Kenny said. Obviously, any athlete would take issue in their mid 20s with the last part of it, you know. Um, but I do think this is frustrating for Jimmy Crute, Ken Flo, because I think he felt like this was going to be that fight for him and he's yeah. talked so much about focus and discipline and keeping a low profile and incremental steps one percent better and yeah i i think that he's probably pretty frustrated he seemed frustrated with his performance and that's why i think he wants to run this one back uh you have anything for us on the light heavyweights brian petrie yeah i mean jimmy crew showed a lot of heart i mean i had I, the only play i had was menafield by knockout so when jimmy crew got put like a zombie walking in potholes i'm screaming like we got it and then the guy just won't go away. You won't go away. And, and Kenny made a good point. I mean, listen, cardio, you know, ABC, always bet cardio. Jimmy Crude, if I feel like if he had just a little more in the gas, because he had some positions on the ground where you could have really took advantage of it. It was just a little sloppy, in my opinion. Um, he is a young kid, so, you know, young guy, so there, there, there's room to prove. But a lot of men feel I have more issue with him. It's like you're, you're piecing him up at range, and I know you're tired, but then you slam in the distance and just hug him, and then you get taken down. I'm like, what are we doing here, man? Like, you don't want to be there, but you keep be- putting yourself there. 
Uh, shout out Pat Barry in the corner. Pat Barry in the corner always gets me fired up. I love, you know, yeah, I Pat's mean, the man. He just, he you got to think though, the, the general safe side somewhere in Dallas uh, taking issue yeah. with the decision making. Um, all right. Yeah. Congrats to Modestus Bukowskis, the, uh, the Lithuanian Englishman with a win over Tyson Pedro, who I think was dealing with food poisoning, but that takes nothing away from Modestus who uh, had three fights, including a cage warriors title fight. If not two of them, three fights inside of 14 weeks and uh, good to see him back in the big it show. Devastating great. leg injury looked yeah. awesome. You know, Josh Kulabau, um, you know, with respect, don't let the stretch marks fool you folks. Three consecutive wins. He's a real problem at featherweight. Yeah. And you know what? He's got, submissions right we like submission offense on the show if you can't tell yeah, and uh clay and rodriguez my goodness i mean jesus man i mean can you yeah. send a coffee cake to shannon ross's family <laughs> fucking hey <laughs> all right it's now time for the pronunciation of the week as we spin it forward ufc fight night beckons this weekend how about jessica andraj kenflo stepping up I- i'm telling you right zach candido my producer is listening and i think he's the one that has the conversation with ufc president dana white about the hall of fame I will go to great lengths as long as I'm alive to make sure that Jessica Andrade gets into the Hall of Fame, even if she loses out, Kenny. She has a chance this weekend, now stepping in. She just won a fight in Rio to tie, or excuse me, to break a tie with Amanda Nunes for the most wins in UFC women's history. All hail Jessica Andrade. Yeah. What a beast. I, I, my jaw kind of dropped when I saw the announcement. I'm like, what? Yeah. She's Dude, coming yeah. right, right back in there? Oh, yeah, because people needed to know she's even more of a savage than they already thought. It's just crazy. Just crazy. Yeah. It's cool. Did I say I was going to get her face tattooed on my chest? I did say. <laughs> I might. No, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Now I'm trying to, de- now I'm trying to decide starts. between yeah. – I love the one more sleep Brazil design so much that I really want to get a Brazilian flag tattoo. But then Yaya Rodriguez goes and does that. And then I'm like, maybe I'll get a Mexican flag tattooed on my forehead. You know, I mean, it's just Yair, man. Fucking Yair Rodriguez. If you're listening. All right. So this pronunciation of the week, just LOL, man. I mean, I haven't called his fight before. He was the ultimate fighter runner up. I believe, lo- losing to Mohamed Usman in his UFC debut last year. First name, Zach, Z-A-C. He doesn't need the H nor the K. Last name, P-A-G-U-A. So we call on the executive producer of this fine program, Cody Barrow. Cody, what are you at your girlfriend's house? I mean, what happened to like you like being in your own studio? Where are you? You at the library? The Miami, Florida, South Beach, Anakin Florian podcast studio is under construction. So wait yeah. to get that. Together. Cody teased that he might be moving to Florida. So now I'm going to out you on the air wow. and see if you can put those. Wow. Words in action. Florida boy. Yeah. Wants to hang out with my twin brother. Uh, yeah. That's really Makes why sense. you guys can, <laughs> uh, my longer wants you guys can too. do those like Stop bong on. rips together or whatever you guys do. No, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> hey, so, <laughs> oh, to man. the, United States Commission for Sober Foundation. Whoa, Giant. we got to stay in this four wide more often. Look at the backdrop behind Kenny Flory. I mean, look at how gorgeous. Yeah. What do they call those white cupboards with the uh, the little like uh, the little tufted, things in the tufted background? Oh there, my there goodness, man, Kendra. Did you move your desk, Kenny? You look. You used to be closer, right? I did. I'm did more far it? forward. I had to move it forward. I, I I have a hard line for my internet now, so the internet. Oh been God! Huge. No I, I was up. sick Smart. of that. Yeah, that was a Smart. shot at you, John. Yeah, that was a shot at <laughs> yeah. me. So, so is this an office? Can I ask if this is an office is. you're in right now? It hey, is. Chris, is it Ken Flo's fucking office? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> if I, you want me to pan to my master bedroom right now? I don't even. Should I do that? No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Uh, all right, so uh, Cody, uh, John's Zach, Zach P. Really um, how how do you pronounce this name? Uh, so I know this one. Uh, I I, Ooh, I feel really? like I saw it come through, and I was like, I, I know that this is Zach Paunga. All right, Ooh. so Zach Paunga. Let's hear. Let's hear Zach say it. My name is Zach the Ripper Paunga. Zach the Ripper Paunga. Paunga. Kenny's going to ding me for that. Paunga. Because it's it's a swallow G, right? Yeah. That's the issue. So I haven't called one of his fights yet, Kenny, but it's almost like Paunga. He he swallows the G. Paunga. Fucking choking on the G. (laughs) So, I mean, I'm inclined to give him because the syllabic emphasis Right. Was correct. I'm inclined to give him three and zero on the year. If you are, 
I would have I would have been wrong on it. I'll give it to him. I'll give it to Cody. I, I would have pronounced it like hey. one of those big ships. So they like pull the horn like Bauga. But he got it. He got it right. He got it right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Dude, if I ever call this fight, that's broadcast. what it is. If he gets a win, right? <laughs> All that's aboard, a- Zach Bauga. <laughs> that that's that's right. There, that man. Man. Yeah. That's, that's the gold you're getting on the PFL on ESPN and plus folks, by the way, challenger series, Orlando, you getting sick of the back and forth yet? Eight, eight consecutive weeks or what? reminds me of Bellator season one. It was like 10 consecutive weeks. It's like, how you doing with all that? You all right? I uh, mean, Oh yeah, yeah I'm you, fine. I'm good, man. Okay. You know, right. I, I don't get a whole lot of sleep on the weekend, but uh, hanging in there, man. Hanging in. How many yeah. weeks in are you three, four weeks in we got three weeks? I got five more right. weeks left kid. Yeah. All right. I think our buddy Danny Rube is going to come to a show, so I might come sit with him. Dude, let's do, let me though. know. Yeah, I'm a UFC guy. Might not come. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let us update the standings as far as I'm concerned. My record shows there were no added units, so it was minus $240 for Brian Petrie and minus $240 for Kenny Florian. Exact same picks really just got burned on Tyson Pedro, and everything else was uh, pretty close across the board. BP, does that sound correct? I think I, I mean, it, it does sound correct, but I did add a mortal on Yair. If that is okay. not tally, I believe okay. I did. So, okay. All right. So we will check the record for that and adjust accordingly. So a multi-unit Thank play you. on Yair. No, I mean, of course I, that's why I always check with you. Cause I know uh, you will correct me. I did not have that written down in my, in my uh, notes, but we will, uh, we will check the record and uh, adjust accordingly. So I'm already making mistakes. All right. So we have a fight night, obviously, that is now headlined by Jessica Andraja, not Tyler Santos. Still don't know exactly what happened to Tyler, why she's out of the fight, but certainly a stylistically different challenge in front of one Aaron Blanchfield. We're going to start, though, with uh, a challenge that Jimmy Miller did not expect to have this weekend. Alexander Hernandez, minus 240, the ageless Jim Miller, plus 200. Jim Miller was to face Gabriel Mowgli Benitez. Ken Flo, what number UFC fight is this for Jim Miller? What oh. number UFC fight is this for Jim Miller? No man nor woman has more. It's going to make you laugh. It's going to make you laugh. I don't even know, dude. I mean, it's... You're going to probably be way off. 20, 25, 30? I don't know. How, how many? It's his 41st UFC appearance. <laughs> 41, bro. That's crazy. 40. I mean, it makes sense. One. I mean, uh, wow. He's my generation. 41. He's been fighting forever, dude. What an mm-hmm. animal. 41st UFC. And it's probably his like 43rd UFC fight week, right? Because some of these fights go away. But 41st That's UFC insane. appearance for Jim Miller taking on Alexander Hernandez. Jim Miller, by the way, is only one three in a row. On the other side, Alexander, the great ape Hernandez, has dropped two in a row. He's finished by Billy Q. Uh, Bry in his return mm-hmm. to featherweight. Now back at 55 on short notice. What are we doing here? I mean, how great is Jim Miller? I think we just talked about it. Who doesn't like this guy? You, you, how can you not root for this guy? And I think this is a good matchup for him. I know Hernandez is coming on short notice here, but Miller, the old dog of 39, is on a three-fight win streak. You know, and all three of those are finishes. Like, this dude is on top of his game right now. He's like, I really find like a nice you know, streak going here. And the Hernandez is still trying to figure that glory from the old Benny Darius knockout. He knocked out Darius in his, in his debut, and everyone labeled this, this is the next big thing right here. Kind of falling short. He's, he's jumped around a little bit, some different things. Tried 45. His last win was against Mike Breedy, who never won the UFC. So he doesn't really have too many great wins in the UFC besides the Benny Darius fight. And, uh, you know, his last fight against Billy Q, I, it could have been the 45 weight draw, uh, cut. It could have been a lot of things. He just seemed uninspired. He didn't want to be there. Um, and when you're hanging a minus 240 on me, I know Jim Miller's 39, but when Alex Hernandez, who has not looked good at minus 240, get out of my face with that. Give me the dog here with Jim Miller, plus 200. I like it. I mean, this guy debuted at UFC 89. You don't think he's seen some shit? Uh, yeah, huh. give me Jim Miller. I think by finish, too. I don't know if it's going to be knockout or choke. Hernandez has a little shaky chin, uh, but I think he gets it done with inside the uh, inside the distance there, boys. You know, we try to get back to the fans here on the Anakin Florian podcast. I'm thinking we might all of a sudden start letting a fan come into the main event challenge just to watch it. And they can be on camera only so we can have the four box because I miss those white tufted cupboards that just went away. (laughs) Cody leaves for the pronunciation of the week. And now it's like, I want to see the cupboards again. (laughs) Do that. Uh, Can flow Jim Miller plus 200 Alexander Hernandez minus 240 odds furnished by DraftKings Sportsbook. Which way are you going? 
That's good shit. Uh, Cody just put in the chat, George W. Bush was still president. Would you feel with that? That's, wow. that's, that's insane. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm with Brian here, man. First of all, we, we were just talking about, you know, fight IQ and making good decisions. Alexander Hernandez, he's got he's got the physical capability. You know, I think tactically he makes a lot of poor decisions and he's taking this on late notice against a dude in Jim Miller who knows exactly what he wants to do. Not always successful in doing it, but I think he can be successful enough here against Hernandez. Uh, Jim Miller, he's going to fight smart. He's going to try to bring the fight into his wheelhouse. Does he have fight experience, guys? Yeah, 41 fights. That's insane. Uh, Give me Jim Miller here as well. And I think he had 11 or 12 wins before he even got to the big show. I'll never forget 2008, an MMA live full screen when Jim and Dan Miller, I think, left the IFL or wherever they left and they signed with the UFC. And uh, Ken Flo and I were uh, on top of it. Your news and information show. Mixed Martial Arts Live back in 2008 when when I could still attract the opposite sex. All right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Next up, I think this one's a light heavyweight, Bri. William Knight, yeah. minus 115. Marcin Pracnio, minus 105. Pracnio's one, two, or three. Did lose his only fight last year to Felipe Monstro Linz. Knight has lost two in a row. Maxime Grecian, and most recently, Devin Brown Bear Clock via TKO last April. But both of those were at heavyweight for Knight, uh, mm-hmm. who now has a 10-month hiatus between fights. Your thoughts on William Knight, not in the weight room, but in the octagon this weekend, Brian Page. Yeah, I always say I love pick and fights, right? Well, I found one I don't. I have no uh-huh. idea how to attack this fight. Prackningo was KO in his first three fights. Four of his six losses are by KO. So he's obviously got a chin problem. He looked pretty good against clear round tree, kept his distance, kept his good kicks, looked pretty good against Ike Villanueva, but you know who who doesn't look good against Ike Nishat? Sorry, Ike. Uh, and then he dropped against Philip, Philip Linz. And then we got uh, William Knight, who missed weight by Maxine Grissom by 12 pounds, made it a heavyweight fight. Then he fought Devin Clark at heavyweight, right? So now his nickname is Stick Willie. So we got Stick Willie here. And to me, it's like, I don't even know what to do here. You know, uh, how to pick this fight. John distracts me cracking up. What to do this fight? <laughs> this is a scales fight to me. This is a scales fight. I got to see Thick Willie on the scales. Um, with that being said, I guess Practico, Practico, because, you know, he maintains distance well. He's got good kicks. Uh, you know, this is a fight I'm not going to, I'm not going to really run the bet right now, but, you know, give me Marcin. Uh, I, I, I don't love it. The sorry, Ike. I, I'm underslept, but sorry, Ike just <laughs> buckled me. All right, Marcin Cracknio, minus 105, the pick to click for Brian Petrie. Ken Flo, you going the other way with uh, with William Knight? I mean, Alir Latifi has retired. I was going to say he could be the new backyard shed, but I think Thick Willie is the way to go, right? Is that what you said, Thick Willie? Thick Willie. Thick Willie, oh, Thick yep. Willie William Knight, Ken Flo, what do you think? William Knight, Marcin Cracknio. Dude, listen, um, you know, when I look at both guys, you know, both guys are pretty built. But as far as athleticism, movement of what really stands out, you know, to me, William Knight is that dude. I mean, the, the guy could do flips upon flips, does a split after he wins. Uh, just built like unbelievable. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, the complete opposite of me. Uh, and and Marcin Pracnio, you know, I, I think he's a little stiff out there. He's got some good kicks. Um but I, I don't think there's anything that really stands out as being special. William Knight still developing talent. Um, you know, I know he's a hard worker, works works out with a buddy of mine. Um, and you know, this guy you know, sings his praises. Um but I think William William Knight's athleticism is special, and, and I think that's one of those things that can really stand out here against a fighter like Marcin Pracnio. So um, it, it looks like it's tight, but uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty clear that William Knight's going to win, but uh, I've certainly been wrong before. Let's go, William Knight. Just the one unit on William Knight, Ken Flo? You sound Let's go like one uh, unit for now. Okay. All right. Yes, for now. Updated standings, by the way, we're – Going to be minus 170 for Ken Flo and minus 450 for Petrie, but obviously Petrie's number is going to get a little bit better. Um, all right, let us get to the co main event. Zach Paunga, minus 275. Jordan Wright, plus 230. I guess if I was coaching talent on the name, I would say try to separate it into two surnames and say Paunga, so you don't say Paunga. Paunga, Zach Paunga. Minus 275. The Beverly Hills Ninja Jordan Wright is plus 230. He's got the janitor, Vladimir Matyushenko, and Anthony Hardong still in his corner. What? <laughs> Paunga dropped his UFC debut to Mo Usman last year. Wright has been finished in three mm-hmm. consecutive fights. I don't think it's suggested, Brian, to say his job could be on the line here. Jordan Wright, right. Zach Paunga, which way are you going? 
So I've been a nice little fortune fading Jordan Wright, you know, and and betting uh, his unders. I mean, the guy goes forward, hands oh, down, yeah. hands up, doesn't matter, just smash. Like he is, if if the rounds were two minutes, he might be on the feed it because he wins those first two minutes. He's very explosive and uh and violent. It, and that's it. But Haunga, did I say now I'm messing it up, that's John? Pretty good. Know. No, that's pretty good. Okay, he's 34, only has six fights. Made it to the finals a tough, uh, tough loss to Moseman, and the fight was very competitive. But thirty-four time is ticking with only six fights. I know he has a, a background in, uh, in other sports, um, but I, I just don't know, man. I, I've never picked Jordan Wright before, and and I think I'm leaning towards Jordan Wright here. It's fifty-fifty, kill or kill or be killed here. And you know, you always abt, always bet talent sometimes, right? When it's a close fight, and I think Jordan Wright's a talented fighter. I do think he is. Chin problem, fight IQ, all that, that's a problem. But I do think he has some weapons that could be a problem here uh, against an inexperienced guy. And, and Jordan Wright has been in there with some good guys. Give me Jordan Wright. I don't know why I'm laboring it here. Uh, I'm going to hammer the under for sure. The under fight yeah. doesn't go to the distance. All that's great play. But give me right by KO. Zach Punga is a good guy. He, uh, I think I just screwed up his name, but he uh, he coaches several of the elite, elite fighters. So I have met him along the way. Tries to get his first win here against the Beverly Hills Ninja, Jordan Wright. Ken Flo, which way are you going on the co-main event? Yeah, listen, I, I think Brian's right on this one as far as, you know, the breakdown. You know, Paunga is a, a guy who can win this fight as well. I, I don't like that number. Minus 275 mm -hmm. against a guy, Jordan Wright, um, who is going to be dangerous early on for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I haven't seen enough uh, out of Paunga to say, you know, he, he deserves that number necessarily. Um I could see him also, you know, looking for takedowns and trying to put right on his back. You know, right can fade in fights and kind of make mm -hmm. poor decisions. But when you have a fight that this that's this close and you see these numbers with this big disparity, you know, yeah. unfortunately, I, I got to go the same way here. I, I can't go any differently. You know, Jordan Wright. You know, that's that that's the guy I got to go with with that kind of number with that plus 230. And Star. when I talk about the bankrolls for these guys, it's not at all reflecting of the year that they've had handicapping the be right. The where that's the thing. It's like you're so prevented from betting someone like Zach Paunga, right? In our setting, mm -hmm. right? You lose three hundred dollars yeah. if he loses the fight. You might as well just put a hundred bucks on Jordan Wright and move on to next week. You know, candidly, mm -hmm. Brian Petrie. You should be asking off this show, right? You should ask to be a pay per view guy. This show too small for you, but you know what? <laughs> we appreciate yeah. you showing up. No, no, no. This is this is my show, Ray. I love you guys. Poor Kemp was like, what about me, dude? You know? <laughs> All right. Main event. Jessica Andrade, minus 165. Aaron Blanchfield, plus 140. Blanchfield, 3-0 and in the UFC. Bri, she's won seven mm -hmm. in a row. Lone pro loss via split decision to one Tracy Cortez. How do you handicap the main event? Man, when you announced this fight on the broadcast, like this broke my brain. Like I was, I was like, wait, what? And because I was all over Blanchfield over Santos. I, I like Aaron Blanchfield a lot. She's a top prospect. And Andrade's one of my arguably one of my favorite fighters. And I think this is this is probably a better fight, you know, I think for the fans. Andrade has sledgehammers. She's landed, she landed 231 strikes against Murphy, almost three, four hundred through 400 strikes. Not that long ago. And, you know, without even breaking a sweat, didn't really look like her cardio was all that compromised. Takes this fight here. And, you know, Aaron Blanchard goes, who, what, when? Okay, cool. This girl's 23 years old. Like the confidence in that to go against Andrade, who's fought everyone, three different weight classes. Is, is impressive. It's impressive. And this fight is breaking my brain because Andrade has 63% takedown defense. Aaron Blainstreet has a 78% takedown percentage. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sounding like fucking Yanni the Greek now with all these stats, but that's what I got to resort to when my gut's telling me well, well, not what to do. But I keep thinking of Andrade and I keep thinking about the Valentina Shevchenko fight. Now, we all know Valentina Shevchenko is the pound for pound best female fighter in the world. Heaven forbid I compare to, I would never compare Aaron Blainstreet to her, but in that fight, whether Andrade looked good or not, she did get taken down seven times, and the seventh time she couldn't get up and got finished on the ground. That's where Aaron Blainsfield soars. That's where she's good. She only got four fights in UFC. She's twenty three. Is she biting off more than she can chew? I, I don't know. You know, MMA Twitter loves Blainsfield right here. A lot of people are in the dog shot, and I'm gonna fall suit. I'm gonna fall suit. I'm gonna be a little sheep. And I'm gonna fall suit. I think Blainsfield oh. by the shit. Well, my decision here is a way to go. But man, I really don't know. I don't have a ground. I'm not locking anything up this week. Because I truly don't know. I'm just excited to watch the fight. I love it. Jessica Andrade, 
minus 165, Aaron Blanchfield plus 140. Credit to both sides, of course, Ken Flo, but particularly when it comes to Aaron Blanchfield, I'm not sure if maybe she was able to negotiate a new contract. Opportunity knocks, there's no doubt about it, but certainly wouldn't you like to have a little bit more time to prepare for Andrage? No. Yeah. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I, you know, this, this, I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, is is Blanchfield this good? It, it does her management and coaching um, are they that confident that they're taking this fight and just like yeah oh yeah Jessica Andrade that Jessica Andrade chick yeah let's bring it um, I don't know maybe she is that good but I have to go with what I've seen and I have to lean on experience here and that is tough you see people that have the potential or have the skills to beat another person but. Doing it inside the UFC's octagon is a completely different beast altogether, and that takes time. Maybe it doesn't with Aaron Blanchfield. Maybe she is that good. Um, but uh, I, I think Jessica Andrade wins this fight. I think the odds are close enough where I think it's worth sticking with the favorite here in Andrade. Yeah. Um, she's coming off a fight not too long ago. Um, I think she's shown improvement as well. I love the youth and the skills from Blanchfield. I just want to see more. Uh, so I don't know. May I'd love to be surprised here. Let's go with Jessica Andrade, though. All right, Kemflo likes Jessica Andrade. It's a great main event. You can see it this weekend on ESPN+. Plus. Also a great main event next weekend, Nikita Krilov and Ryan Spann in the light heavyweight division. So I think BP will probably talk to you uh, in advance of that one. Uh, yeah, what did you think of, of the Super Bowl before we let you go? Uh, I thought it was good. I, I, I begrudgingly watched it. Um, but you know, I mean, I, you know, we can, we can make the comments about the refs at the end there, helping the Chiefs, whatever, but no, it was a very fun Super Bowl. Uh, two Cincinnati guys, the Kelsey brothers. I mean, they're not from Cincinnati, but they graduate UC, you know, that, that was fun watching two brothers. Gave play. you a That's little bit cool. of something there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, buddy. Uh, at Brian Petrie MMA, if you want more and, uh, candidly, why wouldn't you? Why fucking That's wouldn't right. you? Uh, appreciate the time, buddy. We'll talk to you, uh, in a few days. Absolutely. One quick shout out to Nas, Please. Ray Longo's guy. I don't know him personally or anything like that, but I've been doing, I'm recording my podcast uh, today. And that is a guy that I'm, I'm looking to bet heavy on. He's a great number at minus 170 right now. Good matchup with Evan Elder. So want to shout him out. He's a good talent. Love it. Thank you, buddy. Have a good weekend. We'll see, see you boys. soon. There he is, Brian Petrie, with us here on the Anik and Florian podcast. Um, Ken Flo, real quick, because we didn't get to earlier in the week, I just wanted to acknowledge Jens Pulver. And uh seemed like an eventuality that he was going to get into the UFC Hall of Fame. But uh, it just speaks to something that I alluded to on social media over the weekend when I talked about all the love that I received in Australia. And being able to share that with my family was really special. But the most basic human need, yeah, food, water, but the most basic human need is to feel appreciated. And I think Jens Pulver doing work, right? The Twitch channel for the UFC, there's a certain amount of appreciation that comes with that, right? Being brought back into the fold and being a part of things. But um, this is the ultimate appreciation for a fighter. And uh, obviously as somebody who, uh, is omnipresent throughout UFC lightweight history yourself. I'd imagine it was pretty cool for you to see that acknowledgement for Jens over the weekend. It's also important, I think, to appreciate the people that came before you. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And, um, you know, I know for myself, I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for guys like Jens Pulver. Uh, I, I, I came up watching a lot of his fights and what he did in this sport uh, was just amazing. One of the new breed of true mixed martial artists who, who could do it all. And um, it was great to see him get that acknowledgement and, and uh you know there's so many people who have no idea who jens pulver is uh which is which is very sad but if you've come up in this sport for a long time if you've watched it from the beginning um this is a a legend uh truly that should be respected uh and has accomplished so much you know for, for some of you guys that might remember jens pulver you're, you're seeing him at the end of his career right all that stuff but that's not really who jens pulver was uh he was an absolute beast back in the day uh, a guy who was also undersized and underestimated and came through very similar similar to frank yedgar when he was winning all those belts so um awesome to see jens pulver get that acknowledgement man and get into the hall of fame uh you know well-deserved doesn't really do it justice, but uh, man, awesome to see. Nicely put. And his reaction, of course, uh, elicited tears from a lot of us 
throughout the world who are watching that live, even us on broadcast. And a great guy as well, by the way. Yeah, no doubt. And if yes. you are uh, looking to honor the legends further, why not go to Kenny Florian Martial Arts.com when you're done listening or watching the Anakin Florian podcast today. And by the way, if you are subscribed on the DraftKings YouTube channel, we appreciate that very much. If you like our videos, those will populate more than the ones that uh, that maybe don't, you know, you know, fit your fancy. I uh, also want to show you our one more sleep designs for Perth, Western Australia, in case you missed those available at millions.co and a Florian podcast merchandise is yours at anikflorianpodcast.com. Thanks to Brian Petrie. Thanks to Ken Flo. Thanks to our producer, Cody Merrow. Don't forget, remember the show with Bilal Muhammad and Jason Anik Thursday nights live on the Anakin Florian podcast, YouTube channel, several clips from this show as well. And uh, big things coming up next week. We will of course preview the main event between Nikita Krilov and Ryan Spann and get into any number of different different MMA headlines that no doubt were surfaced between now and then. Thank you all for watching, for listening. Tell your friends, tell your moms. We'll talk to you next week. You'll later.